Module 2, Walking as a Disciple, Chapter 1, A Disciple Walks in Authority. There is an authority that rests upon all disciples. It is the authority of Jesus Christ, made possible by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit was poured out so that we can have and walk in power from on high. Therefore, a disciple who believes Jesus is the Son of the living God and is the Messiah, and those who believe in the eternal kingdom of God and those who are willing to lay down the self for the glory of the King shall walk in the authority of the Lord. And such authority comes not from the self or from man, but from God himself. Matthew 28 verse 18 says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the age. Amen. Jesus said in John 15 that if we abide in him, then he will abide in us. He was saying that the more we die to the self, the more we will be living in the fullness of God, meaning the fullness of His authority, the fullness of the anointing of the Spirit, and the fullness of His glory. His holiness and glory will be manifested in us. The Lord has given us this authority, according to Matthew 28, to be His messengers in this world and to be His instruments of service. The authority is imparted so that we can fulfill our purpose, our calling and our mandate. Authority rests upon the disciples to fulfill the Great Commission and by such a fulfillment set people free from the clutches of spiritual darkness, from pain, hurt, bondages and torment. Jesus' first ministry work was to get rid of the devil out of his life. When the devil tempted Jesus in the wilderness, Jesus stood on the authority of the word and put the devil in his place. Just so we have the authority to make sure that the devil has no part of our lives and we have the authority to lead others also to freedom and liberty. The authority invested in Jesus, now invested in his disciples, is the authority over death, sin and forces of darkness. We read of the well-known scripture in Mark 5. They came to the other side of the sea, to the region of the uh, Gerasenes, and as soon as he got out of the boat there, he met him out of the tombs, a man under the power of an unclean spirit. This man continually lived among the tombs, and no one could subdue him any more, even with a chain, for he had been bound often with shackles for the feet and handcuffs, but the handcuffs of light chains he wrenched apart. And the shackles he rubbed and ground together and broke in pieces, and no one had the strength enough to restrain or tame him. Night and day, among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always shrieking and screaming and beating and bruising and cutting himself with stones. And when from a distance he saw Jesus, he ran and fell on his knees before him in homage, and crying out with a loud voice, he said, what have you do, do, to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? What is there in common between us? I solemnly implore you by God, do not begin to torment me. For Jesus was commanding, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is your name? And he replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he kept begging him urgently not to send them send them and the other demons away out of that region. Now a great herd of hogs was grazing there on the hillside, and the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the hogs, that we may go into them. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out of the man and entered into the hogs. And the herd, numbering about two thousand, rushed headlong down the steep slope into the sea and were drowned in the sea. Jesus walked with authority, for he was authority. When the demon-possessed man saw Jesus from a distance away, he ran to Jesus because he knew this is someone who can help him. And this is the kind of authority that should be evident in us, for we abide in Jesus who abides in us, 
If we truly walk as his disciples, those who are in torment, bondage and in trouble should be able to recognize the presence of God within us. And like this man who ran towards Jesus, we need to walk in authority so that anyone who requires healing, spiritual or emotional or physical or deliverance, should take note of us from afar and run to us. They should run to us because they should sense and know that we can help, and we can only help if God's authority rests upon us as his disciples. Again, such authority comes not from the self, but it comes from the Lord. By preaching the gospel in the authority of Jesus, we take captive all things that are opposed to God. Such authority loosens the spiritual and emotional chains that binds and yokes so many people. Question. Can people recognize the authority within you? Can people recognize the presence of God? Do people seek you out for help to be free, to be saved, to be delivered, and to be healed? We must just be available as disciples to serve and be ready to be used by the Lord as disciples who walk in spirit and in truth. Those who abide in the Lord as disciples have been given the keys to heaven to bind and to loose. Matthew 16 verse 19 says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. We have been given the authority to preach the gospel. According to John 8, the truth shall set you free. The truth is Jesus. So when we preach Jesus, we preach truth. And when we do, and when we do so in spirit and in truth, we preach in the authority that the truth sets people free from bondages, yokes, and strongholds. Of, G of Jesus we read in Colossians 1 verse 13. The Father has delivered and drawn us to himself out of the control and dominion of darkness and has transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have our redemption through his blood, which means the forgiveness of our sins. Now he is the exact likeness of the unseen God, the visible representation of the invisible. He is the firstborn of all creation, for it was in him that all things were created, in heaven and on earth, things seen and things unseen, whether thrones, dominions, rulers or authorities, all things were created and exist through him, by his service, intervention and in all for him, and he himself exists before things. And in him all things consist, cohere and held together. He also is the head of his body, the church, seeing he is the beginning, the firstborn from among the dead, so that he alone in everything and in, any, in every respect might occupy the chief place, stand first and be preeminent. For it has pleased the Father that all the divine fullness, the sum total of divine perfection, powers and attributes, should dwell and in him permanently. And God purposed that through by the service, the intervention of him, the Son, all things should be completely reconciled back to himself, whether on earth or in heaven, as through him the Father made peace by means of the blood of his cross. And although you at one time were estranged and alienated from him and were of hostile attitude of mind, in your wicked activities. Yet now has Christ the Messiah reconciled you to God in the body of his flesh through death in order to present you holy and faultless and irreproachable in his, the Father's presence. And this he will do, provided that you continue to stay with and in the faith in Christ, well grounded and settled and steadfast, not shifting or moving away from the hope which rest on and is inspired by the glad tidings, the gospel which you heard and which has been preached as being designed for and offered without restrictions to every person under this heaven and of which sufferings on your behalf, oh sorry, the gospel I, Paul, became a minister. Even now I rejoice in the midst of my sufferings on your behalf and in my own person I am making up whatever is still lacking and remains to be completed on our part of Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. Colossians 2 verse 15 God disarmed the principalities and the powers that were raged 
against us and making a bold display and public example of them in triumphing over them in him and in it the cross. Ephesians 1.18 I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy, peop in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for, for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Just as important as, as knowing who Jesus is, as, re, as presented in the Ephesians and Colossians epistles, is to now know our place in Jesus. At times we can forget the authority that Jesus carries, for in him rest all authority, dominion and glory. Yet when we abide in him, we abide in such dominion and authority. Ephesians 2 verse 6 says, And he raised us up together with him and made us sit down together, giving us joint seating with him in the heavenly sphere by virtue of our being in Christ Jesus, the Messiah, the Anointed One. We are raised with Jesus in spirit, and thus spiritually in this world we are seated with him in the highest authority. We should walk in such authority and people and and the devil should know and recognize that we function according to our heavenly place. This is what it means to be a disciple. A true disciple walks with God, follows him, serves him, abides in him, abiding in his truth and spirit, and thus is seated in heavenly places. The heavenly places is not reserved for those walking in religion or hypocrisy, but for those who truly obey his commandments and who seeks his ways and will. The heavenly place are reserved for those who have a relationship with the Lord, who seeks his kingdom and his righteousness above all and anything else. These days it however seems as if we are struggling to walk in authority, mainly because our authority rests not in our relationship with God, but in our comfort with knowledge. Authority comes down to legality, and for those who have a relationship with God are legally permitted to exercise God's authority in faith and in the power of the Holy Spirit to the power of God. Very important, we can do very little on earth if we are not legally compliant. An illegal immigrant cannot walk, work in a country where he has fled to if he is illegal. He is then not recognized as, a be, as being legal and cannot function in order to work and earn wages. He is also not legal to receive any benefits from such a government. Anybody will agree we will rather receive a service um, in terms of labor from someone who has a legal backing, meaning some kind of legal training in his trade. And this is how it is with the kingdom of God. Authority therefore comes down to being legal. In the spiritual realm, it, in order to be recognized, and by such recognition, there is the freedom and the liberty to fulfill an assignment task. This is how we operate with God. Your legality and recognition comes from God, and He recognizes and knows who His disciples are truly. You cannot buy such legality or recognition. Neither can you fool the spiritual realm. Just as God knows who truly serves Him, so does the devil know if we walk in authority. When it comes to the Lord's work, we have to be legal to be recognized to serve the kingdom. Otherwise, we are an illegal spiritual immigrant. If we fall not under the authority of God because of our covenant with the eternal king, we work for the kingdom illegally and will not receive any recognition for our service. Think about it this way. In order to be legal, one needs to fall under the authority of a government. If we do not fall under the authority of the kingdom, how we can how can we then fulfill our mandate or our calling legally? This means our service will hardly be recognized by the reigning authority 
or by those wishing to oppose us. An illegal worker constantly has to operate out of the sight of the authorities, but with God the Lord will see all those who operate in his name, and he will know if we operate illegally or not, and so does Satan. He knows who operates legally and who operates illegally. Therefore we cannot fool God or Satan when it comes to the spiritual. After all things who walk in the kingdom of light as disciples of the Lord are opposed in thought, action, behavior and immorality to those who walk in the kingdom of darkness. In Acts 22 Paul was handed over to be flogged for being rebellious in the eyes of the Jewish leaders and as they bound him with thongs, Paul said to the centurions who stood by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? When the centurion heard that, he went and told the commander, saying, Take care what you do, for this man is a Roman. Then the commander came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman? He said, Yes, the commander answered. With a large sum I obtained this citizenship. And Paul said, But I was born a citizen. Then immediately those who were about to examine him withdrew from him, and the commander was also afraid of the found out that he was a Roman, and because he had bound him. Paul was a Roman citizen, he therefore had rights, including a fair trial as a Roman citizen, and by these rights he can exercise his legal authority. This is how it works in the spiritual realm. If we are citizens of the kingdom of God, we have rights and we have legal authority to act on behalf of the kingdom. We are citizens of heaven as mentioned in Ephesians 2. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in which the whole building being full together, fitted together, grows into an holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. As citizens of heaven we have rights, and by that right, as granted by our citizenship, we can exercise our authority, while it is true that on earth some may get it right to operate in a country illegally. This is not the case with spiritual authority. God cannot be mocked. Satan cannot be fooled, but men can be deceived. This is why there are most assuredly believers out there who are walking around operating under false authority. It is after all easy to convince someone of our spiritual authority and this is what is happening in churches worldwide. We are blinded by all the noise, smoke and mirrors. There are those who operate for the kingdom and they... And by all accounts, it all appears good and proper, but ultimately there is a false authority in operation. Such pretense authority cannot legally function in accordance to heaven's recognition. Therefore, we will have no impact to set people free from the grip of darkness. Authority is not based on our qualification or our ability, but it is based on our relationship with God. It is not based on our gifts, but on our fruit. And it is not based on what we do, but our obedience and our faithfulness to the Lord. A disciple walks in authority because a disciple follows the Master in spirit and in truth. Indeed, those who walk with God walk in a relationship. Such a relationship allows us to walk in the authority of God and is solidified through obedience, staying true to God's order walking in his ways and will. Too often we mistake real authority with false authority because we look at the physical instead of the supernatural. There came a time when Saul no longer carried the authority even though serving as king because his relationship with God had flat faltered. A shepherd boy was anointed to be true king during his childhood because this boy David had a real relationship with God. Real authority therefore rests far deeper than the outward. So often you hear people speak of the great men of God and such assumptions are made on the stature of their ministries. The truth is one can reach the top of any food chain, be it spiritual even without knowing God. You simply have to apply a few marketing tricks 
seduce the masses with sweet words and feed them what they desire and crave. There is a lot of false authority in operation and yes, people are deceived and blinded but God and Satan knows who walks in true authority. This is the beauty of it all and so the humble walking in true relationship will be exalted and the exalted, the false authority will be eventually humbled. False authority is birthed when we follow a religion instead of following God's ways. Re religion is man-made system and designed to appease man while a true living relationship with a living God is thriving, alive, living and true. Religion sets up false authority and while those who serve God operate in a true authority, religion dethrones and relationship enthrones. Fame, fortune, money, popularity and ability does not lead to authority, but true obedience and love and fear for God does unlock such a path. Anyone who operates under religion and not in the living faith of God will easily find themselves stranded when it comes to the matters of the spiritual, such as spiritual warfare. There is no greater evidence of authority when a believer confronts a demon, a demon who, who will know who operates under true authority and who doesn't. Take, for example, the following scripture in Acts 19, verse 13. Then some of the interrogant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord, Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exercise you by, the, by Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom this evil spirit was leapt on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Many of us have, been, have seen movies dealing with exorcisms, it is actually quite laughable that when the, the learned men of the cloth deal with a, de with a demon to fail to exercise the unclean spirit because their authority is not based on a relationship but on a religion. Demons aren't fooled. They know who knows God and who the true disciples of Jesus are. What do we think will happen if someone who operates under a false authority confronts a demon? The demon will turn on that person and slay him, as mentioned in Acts 19. The reality is that spiritual warfare has become watered down, and demons and hell has been denied because so many spiritual leaders do not want a confrontation. We do not want confrontation because we are operating in false authority. A confrontation will expose false authority, shattering a false image of godliness. Churches focus more, focuses more on healing because it is easier to fake a healing than to fake deliverance. It is easier to convince the masses through healing of one's supposed authority than to con convince them that someone is being truly delivered by a demon. After all, a demon is alive and real, and he will not be pushed around by those playing in his camp. For it is written in Matthew 12, verse 25, Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do you, your people drive them out? So then they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Clever sermons and a huge following is surely not a sign that we walk in authority. Only our relationship with God determines our legality in the spiritual realm. It says in Mark 16 in the Amplified Version, verse 20, And they went out and preached everywhere, while this Lord kept working with them and confirming the messages by the attesting signs and miracles that closely accompanied it. The New King James Version says it is it the following way in verse 19. So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. Signs and wonders and miracles were confirming the word of the Lord and his message. Signs and wonders do not attest to the person but the Lord. 
So often we see signs and wonders and then automatically equate it to the ministering servant and to the authority of such a servant. After all, we argue that if there are signs and wonders, that the servant must be anointed. This is not the case according to Mark 16. God upholds his name and his truth and word by performing signs and wonders. He upholds Isaiah 53 that says that by the stripes of Jesus we are healed. He upholds the truth that Jesus is above all dominion. So if we see signs and wonders, it is God moving to confirm the truth of his word and the truth of his message. It never testifies to the spiritual condition or nature of the servant present. A true disciple is only known by his fruits and not by the manifestation of his gift. Our authority thus rests in our relationship with God, which is proven by our fruit and not by our gifts. Therefore be vigilant by testing all spirits and test the fruit to ascertain authenticity of authority. Think about this. How can we really operate in the name of Jesus when we hardly know Jesus? We may know about it and preach about him, but do we really know him? It is like going to someone and telling them you have a right to enter a restricted area because you have been given permission by Jesus. Then the person phones Jesus who says he doesn't know you. This is how it works in the spiritual realm. We can preach and teach Jesus, but do we personally know him? We can fool man, but not heaven or hell. Jesus walked in true authority, and such authority was recognized by Satan, demons, religious leaders, or any other power on earth. Matthew 7, 28, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority, and not as their teacher of the law. The Lord has given us all the mandate, which is our purpose, but we can only fulfill it when we have the backing of the kingdom. And such backing comes down to authority, for you receive the authority, therefore the legal backing of the king, to complete what the Lord has called us to fulfill. When, when we walk in false authority, we can do all things, all, but we can do all that we can, but our mandate will not come into fruition. Romans 12 verse 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How we must seek God's perfect will so that we can walk in His authority. The authority of God allows us to move in the full effectiveness of the gifts. For those who walk in God's authority are those who thus abide in the Lord, and if they abide, they will bear fruit. Authority therefore comes down to walking in character, and character speaks of holiness, integrity, and the continuous walk to maintain our state of sanctification. The Lord calls us to walk in the fullness of divinity, in the divinity of Jesus, and therefore walk in authority. And those who walk according to such authority will be led by the Spirit in order for them to become witnesses, to teach, to preach, and to baptize. In the book of Acts, we read how the disciples received power from above to be witnesses. Thus was one of the primary reasons why the Holy Spirit was poured out, so that we can be uh, equipped for service and to be witnesses. But we can only do so when we are born again and are led by the Spirit, Romans 8. We cannot be led by the flesh or our carnal nature. The Spirit must guide and must lead. For those who are under the guidance of the Spirit and are in submission to the Spirit are those who are allowed, who have allowed their lives to be changed by the inner working of the Holy Spirit. This means our character will be changed. And this also means that we truly abide in Jesus. And as we abide, we abide in authority. Thus the Holy Spirit poured out to lead us in all truth was sent so that we can walk in the image of Jesus. Therefore the Spirit was sent for the purpose that we can abide in Jesus, so that we can walk in full authority. And by that authority we can fulfill the Great Commission. But in order to fulfill the Great Commission, we need to have to have to authority to take a stand against the kingdom of God, darkness. Our authority, however, is not just for the purpose to witness or to be a servant or to fight darkness, but to help us to walk in authority by take, taking authority over our thoughts, our emotions, therefore taking authority over the realm of the soul. 
This is what 2 Corinthians 10 alludes to, the spiritual war. Now I, Paul, myself, am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence uh, I am lowly among you, but being absent and bold towards you. But I beg you that when I am present I may not be bold with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some, who think of us as if we walk according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Indeed, indeed, there is authority invested in God the Father, living in the blood of Christ and the Holy Spirit carries it. It is an awesome, electrifying, pulsating and quickening power that has been legally and spiritually been made accessible and available to those who commit to Jesus as their Savior, to the Father as their Lord and to the Holy Spirit as friend and guide. In order to walk in this authority, one needs to abide in Jesus. Ultimately, therefore, authority comes down to relationship. If we don't have a relationship with God, then we cannot walk in authority of God. Without such a relationship, we are doomed to wander confused and lost, unable to see the kingdom of light manifested through us in the world of darkness.